church. We're so glad that you're here with us today. If you could stand and join us, we're going to worship our King. Rescue store. I have 
Jesus, would you guys do that one more time for all of our first-time guests and those joining us live today. Hello, everyone, and hello. If you're brand new, our team's going to be out in the lobby. We'd love to meet you. Come up to us and say, hey, I'm brand new. A lot going on. We hope you're here to find a place to grow your faith and your family. We've got small groups coming up here in just a couple weeks. Uh, so, you know, think about maybe you're here today and you would like to host 
a small group in your home. You don't have to lead it. You can just open up your home. We also have classrooms here at the church. Uh, you might want to co-lead a group. Think about uh, outdoor groups. Hey, it's summertime, guys. Don't we love the sun right now? There's that sweet spot for the Midwest in May where it's really pretty outside. Uh, but you might want to launch an outdoor group this summer. Think about that. Pray about that. A lot of people come to our church. You'd be amazed at how many people come and say, hey, listen, we love the weekend services, but we came here to find some community. We want to find uh, some friends. We want to get in a group. So those of you, you know what? One of the best ways to be discipled in your life is to help others be discipled. So get in there and get involved in groups, and we'll be telling you more about that soon. Today I want to talk to you a little bit from the life of Elijah, and I'm going to talk to you about sadness today and overcoming uh, depression. You know, May, you've probably heard this if you watch any kind of media, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and there's a lot of people talking about mental health today. And sometimes in the church we've thought, well, you know, that's not something that's in the Bible, but really, um, God really speaks into this topic, and we're going to look at it today in the life of Elijah. You know, there's different emotions that are good but can be bad. You know, God gave us emotions. Anger can be good, but it can be bad, right? Sadness is, there's a normalcy to sadness. If you maybe ask a girl out and she says no, you know, you might be sad a little bit, right? Maybe you tried out for the team and you didn't make it. You might be sad for a little bit. So there's a normal side to sadness. Even sometimes just our disappointments, some of them are kind of funny. And you might be like, oh man, I'm disappointed or sad. Actually, I brought a picture of, you might be excited about buying the sandwich on the screen that you saw the advertisement for over here on the left. But when you buy it, how many walk away sad? A little bit sad, disappointed, maybe mad, maybe angry. I don't know what emotions. Uh, uh, here's a dog who thought he was going to get a meat lover's pizza, but it was vegetable. And uh, don't you love the bottom pictures? I love it when a dog's just like, no, I'm not going to eat it. No, nope, that should have been pepperoni. You know, it's like, I'm not going to eat lettuce. I'm not going to eat a tomato. So, you know, he was sad. <laughs> um. And there's deeper things in our life. Maybe there was something that you were really counting on that didn't go your way and, and you got sad. It's okay to be sad. In fact, one of the things I, I love here about River is it's okay to not be okay, okay? You don't have to have everything together to come here. But uh, yeah, amen. But what can happen in our lives is if we don't work through that sadness, we can get lost in that sadness, if we don't work through our griefs, we can get lost in that grief. And so today, if you're here and maybe you're one of the 50 million Americans that right now is actually struggling with, with some type of depression in your life, I just wanna say, you're not alone. Some of the greatest, most famous people in the Bible went through seasons of dark depression in their life. One of the major prophets, Jeremiah, he was called the weeping prophet. There's an entire book of the Bible that's dedicated to depression, it's called Lamentations. And Jeremiah in that book, he says things like, man, I can't even remember what it's like to hope. I forgot what prosperity is. The apostle Paul, as he's doing this hard ministry of planting churches, he said in Corinthians, he says, there were days we just despaired of life. Sometimes we're going through these dark seasons in our life. We think, man, no one knows, no one cares. Well, I want to tell you, God knows and God cares. Amen. Let's look at the life of Elijah, one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. Some of the biggest miracles happen through Elijah's ministry. It's amazing. He lived during a season when Baal worship was really popular. You know, one of God's commands is, you'll have no other gods before me. And there was a season when Baal worship was just really vibing, man. There was like 450 prophets of Baal and that this big religious system all about the worship of this false god of Baal. And Elijah lived during this time period and there's this amazing story where there's this showdown between Baal and God. Like it came to a head 
It was like, oh no, it's going down today. In fact, this almost reminds me of like uh, the first reality show because it was like on one side, 450 prophets of Baal, on the other side, Elijah, one guy. And they set the terms of the game. They're gonna, they said, listen, we're gonna pray to our God, you pray to your God, and whichever God answers by fire, like we wanna wait, we want fire to come down from heaven and consume this sacrifice this, on this altar. Whoever answers by fire, it will prove their God is the real God. So lights, camera, action, everybody get ready. This is a big show, down, it's about to happen, it's about to go down. The prophets of Baal go first, 450 of them. They start dancing, they start doing their chants, they start cutting themselves, they start early in the morning and it goes like to midday and nothing is happening except these guys are making fools of themselves. One thing I love about Elijah, he's a powerful man of God, but he's a little edgy in his personality. I, I wouldn't even say he's just a little bit maybe sarcastic. He's super confident in his God. After hours of what they're doing, trying to get their God to answer, Elijah's over there and he's like, I don't know, guys, you think he's in the bathroom? I don't think he's coming. That's in your Bible. So then Elijah goes, my turn. Here's what happens, verse 37. Elijah said, answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, the Lord, are God, and, and you're turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned. The sacrifice of the wood, the stones and the soil licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. God answered Elijah by fire. It was a powerful display. It was one of those great moments in his life. You ever had one of those kind of days where it's like, man, things are going really good right now. In fact, there was a couple other miracles that happened. He prayed that it would rain. A three-year drought ended. He outran a chariot. It was like, you ever had one of those days when you're like, man, everything I touched works today. I love this day. You ever had, don't you love those kind of days, right? But then a really intense, evil queen named Jezebel, right? Ahab, the king, goes to tell his wife Jezebel about the big showdown that just happened and how all, all her prophets, the prophets of Baal, lost. Ahab tells Jezebel, Jezebel sends Elijah a message. Not in person, she sends a messenger, okay? You might say today she used Facebook Messenger. I don't know how you want to say that, but she didn't go in person. She sent a messenger with this one announcement, one word for Elijah. She said, by this time tomorrow, you'll be dead. And this great man of God, who had seen God move in amazing ways, seen miracles, fear gripped his soul. Something happened on the inside of him. And here's what happened, verse number three and four. Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba and Juba. He left his servant there. That wasn't a good idea, but he left his servant. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush. He sat down and he prayed that he might die. He went from a really high high to a really low low. He said, Lord, I've had enough. Take my life, I'm no better than my ancestors. Today, I wanna to talk to you about the pathways that we can take that lead us into the cave of sadness and the caves of depression. Would you pray with me today? Lord, I pray that in the next few minutes as we look through the scriptures today that the Holy Spirit will do far more than, than we can do in ourselves. Lord, you can open our spiritual eyes and open our spiritual ears. So, Lord, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit to teach us your word. Give us your wisdom. Open our spiritual eyes. Bring revelation knowledge into our hearts today. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen, amen and amen. If you follow the story, read it later today. Elijah basically ends up in a cave. He's just kind of there hiding. He ran from Jezebel and... I want to talk to you today that's a little bit different type of message than I would do, because normally I would do uh, about a three-point message, but I'm going I'm to give you six points today. Are you ready? Okay. Hey, I promise we'll be done by three o'clock, all right? It, it'll be good. I'm going to give you six pathways that can lead us into that cave. Now, maybe you don't struggle with this in a big way, but listen, we all go through things where we need to understand how 
to stand and anchor, be anchored in God during these times. But I want to tell you how to get there. Last night, somebody said, Pastor, you told me how to get there, but you got to tell me how to get out. Well, this is going to help you today, wherever you're at. And then the second part of this message is what God did to bring Elijah out of that cave. Pathways to the cave, number one, lack of balance. Lack of balance in our lives. I think it's surely possible that Elijah was exhausted at this moment. You think? I mean, there was like three miracles right in a row. I mean, there, first he called fire down from heaven. Come on, how many know that's hard, right? I mean, that's exhausting, right? And then secondly, I mean, he prayed for rain. It had been a three-year drought. And he's in this other place with his servant, and he's like, it's time for this drought to end. And he puts his head between his knees, and he prays. Now, the Bible says, it references this moment in the book of James when he's talking about prayer. He says, Elijah prayed earnestly. He prayed with passion. He put his whole self into his prayer. And he prayed for rain. He sent his servant and says, go out there and see if you can find a cloud. His servant looked. He goes, I don't see a cloud. So Elijah goes back and he prays again. And he asked for rain. And then he says, servant, go out and look and see is there a cloud? He goes back, there's not a cloud. Isaiah, Elijah rather, he, uh, we don't know if he prayed you know, for an hour or a minute or five minutes, however long it was, but we know that it didn't happen after the second time and it didn't happen after the third time. It didn't happen after the fourth time or the fifth time. He kept at it. Seven times he prayed and then he sent a servant out and the servant came back that time and he goes, I thought I saw a little bit of a cloud. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he just got tired of running back and forth. You know, I thought I saw one. But Elijah said, no, that's it. Get ready for the rain. And then he has this moment where he's talking to uh, the king, and they got to get somewhere, and the king takes off in his chariot, right? He's got these horses. And the Bible says the Spirit of God came on Elijah, and he ran ahead of the chariot. I think at this moment right here, I think that... I think that Elijah was very likely exhausted. You know what? Everything is worse when you're tired. You're more likely to see things more darkly when you're exhausted. You're more likely to get into a fight with your spouse when you're tired. You're more likely to make bad decisions when you're tired, when you're exhausted. And I think one of the things we need to be careful of in our life is this whole thing where our life is so fast-paced, it's so busy, we're doing so many things that we're tired on the outside, and more importantly, that we're tired on the inside, and maybe we don't know it. There's a man that wrote a book called The Depression Cure. It's Stephen Lardy is the author, and here's what he said. He said, we were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. He said, we were never designed for that. God created the earth six days, and on the seventh day, he what? He rested, not, not because he needed rest, because he wanted to set a pattern for you and for me. It's called the Sabbath. And so, listen, I'm preaching to the choir. You're here today. You've taken this time aside and said, I'm going to stop my work and I'm going to worship my God. Can somebody just give our God a praise one more time? Come on. I'm going to stop my work and I'm going to worship my God. And so this day that you take as a day of worship and a day of rest, it's more than just the one hour you're here. It's supposed to be that you disconnect, that you stop the traffic, that you disconnect and you do things that will refresh and revive you. I read a book when I was a new pastor about a pastor who kind of got burned out and he, he called this book The Rhythm of Life. And he says your life needs to have this balance. It's worship, work, rest, and play. A lot of people in our day, they take that front part out. They don't come to the weekend. They don't come and say, I'm going to stop everything and I'm going to stop. You know, they'll put play in there or they'll put rest. But listen, we've got to worship and work and we've got to rest and we've got to pray, play and pray. Amen. But in fact, pray before you play. Anyway, so <laughs> number one, lack of balance. Number two, comparison. Notice what Elijah said. He goes, man... I'm no better than my ancestors. Now, there's not a lot written about Elijah's family, his father, his ancestors. Some theologians say he might have been talking about his prophetic ancestors, specifically looking back to Moses, another prophet of God, who also had some very low times. That Elijah began comparing himself possibly to Moses. That he was looking at his life and he's thinking, man, I'm not what I should have been. 
I mean, I'm no better than my ancestors. You know, listen, when the other thing that can happen when you're tired, you begin comparing yourself to other people. Listen, we've all got a call of God on our life, but you don't have to live somebody else's call, amen? The Bible says live worthy of your calling. We've all got an assignment God's given us, but listen, I've talked to someone that's like, man, I was really happy about, you know, how my life was going until I looked on Facebook or until I looked on social media or Instagram and I saw that other family and they were on a vacation at the beach and them is the sunset and it was beautiful and all their kids were so perfect and well-behaved. Maybe you should have seen about 10 seconds before they snapped that photo. Because how many know people put their highlight reels on their social media, right? Now listen, I think social media can be powerful and we can have fun with it. But I also know this, is that social media more lends towards comparing ourselves with other people. Here's what Theodore Roosevelt said about comparison. He said, comparison is the thief of joy. It's the thief of joy. Uh, things are going great. Well, why don't I have that? Oh, man, I wish, I, I wish my spouse was like that person. I wish my kids were like that person. I wish I had that kind of job. See, even back before that, Roosevelt knows, hey, listen, comparison is the thief of joy. In fact, now psychologists say we're basically rewiring our brains of the next generation because we're constantly used to, you know, hey, we got to look at everybody else and see what everybody else is doing. Some of the platform creators and content creators have actually basically gone on an apology tour and said, we're sorry for the bad side of what this does to people's minds. And, and many of them, they, oh, their families, they only they have a limited amount of time. They let their families get on that thing. Well, I want to tell you this today is that Elijah's powerful of a ministry he had, he began to compare himself. And comparison will lead you into the cave of sadness in your life. Number three, negative self-talk. Negative self-talk. If you follow the story later on, Elijah says things like, I'm the only one left. Nobody else is serving God but me. I'm no better than my ancestors. It's kind of like, man, what am I doing? No, no matter that he just did three major miracles, he's like, man, what am I doing? Negative self-talk. Brian Tracy, author and speaker, said this. 95% of our emotions come from the way we talk to ourselves. Anybody here talk to yourself? Sure you do. In fact, it's that inner voice that I'm talking about. We can't let our inner critic grab the microphone and begin to blast ourselves, begin to take our own self down, reminding ourselves of all of our failures, all of our shortcomings, all of what, oh man, we should have done it that way if they hadn't done that. And you begin to think about it. In fact, the psychological term for it is called ruminating. It's when you think about the negative things over and over and over again. If you are here a couple weeks ago, I talked about the other side of ruminating. It's called meditating on the word of God. God told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, hey, I want you to meditate on the word. Keep it in your mouth. Meditate means to think about, talk about. If you remember, I used the analogy of a cow chewing its cud. A cow would take its food in and swallow it and bring it back up and eat it again and get more nutrition out. And that's a picture of how we're supposed to think about the word of God, who God is, who I am in Christ, how much God loves me, how much God cares for me, that God's spirit is on the inside of me now, that I'm a new creation in Christ, that God is guiding me, that, that he's making all things work for my good. I meditate on the word of God and it brings strength into my soul, brings strength into to my spirit, builds the hedge of faith up around my life. But the opposite of that, which we're so tempted to do, and it's so easy to do, is called ruminating. It's when you think about what could have been or what might be if something doesn't work right in your life, if that person had done that, or if I had done it differently, or what the worry is like. Well, we play the what if game, and we think about all the negative things, and we swallow it, and we bring it back up, and we think about it again, and we swallow it. You're basically pouring poison into your soul. And ruminating is one of the things that will take us into the dark place of the cave. Now, listen. I want to tell you, the Bible says that the mind is a battlefield. One of the breakthroughs of modern psychology in the last 50 years or more has been that you get to choose what you think about. Well, guess what? That was written in scriptures many, many, many years ago. The book of Proverbs says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 
The scripture tells us to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Can I tell you something? When I say battlefield, some of you are like, yeah, you know, we're praying. There's a battlefield in Ukraine right now. We're praying for our world. Yep. Can I tell you where a battlefield is every day? Between these two ears. There's a battle going on in your mind, in my mind, every day. And the Bible says that we need to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. I'll let you in on a little secret. Not every thought you think is from God. Not every thought you think is even from you. Sometimes it's a thought that the enemy has planted a seed. Jesus said the devil's a liar. Some of you are believing the lies of the enemy. Some of you are believing what the enemy says about you. If you believe the lie, you can die in the lie. That's why the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians, in that great passage that we all know where he says, hey, listen, bring your anxiety to God and, and ask in Jesus' name, you know, and say, Lord, I'm going to give you this care and this worry. But he doesn't stop there with the prayer. He doesn't just say, give your anxieties to God. In verse number eight, he says this. He says, and then whatever is true, noble, right, pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, then think about such things. Sometimes we pray, Lord, help me, and then we just put all this junk in our minds. Negativity. The apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, says, I want you to pray and give that anxiety to God and tell him what you're praying over, and then I want you to intentionally fill your mind with great thoughts and images. Now, let me tell you something. He didn't write that from the Ritz-Carlton on the balcony overlooking, you know, some beautiful body of water. He, did, he wasn't like, oh, guys, I wish you could see what I see right now. Come on, just go to a happy place. Think something good. No, he wrote that scripture in prison, chained to probably a big old stinky guard guy, okay? And he's saying, listen, when you pray, I want you to intentionally choose the thoughts and think about what is good and pure and lovely. I want to give you good news today. You can overcome the battle that's going on in your mind when you intentionally choose to think the thoughts that God gives you in his word. The next thing today, amen, amen. We're talking about pathways into the cave of sadness today. Next thing is when we have a distorted perspective of life. What do I mean by that? Well, we live in basically a narcissistic society that says, hey, it's all about you. You know, and your life's going to be great and get all the pleasure you can. And man, it, and, and it's all about you and it's just going to be you number one. But here's the problem. We live in a fallen world. This is not heaven yet, Right. And Jesus told us that in the world, we would have trouble. There would be hard things we have to go through. He says it rains on the just and the unjust. And so when you take this kind of narcissistic mindset, it's all about me, and then you have this perspective, but then we live in this fallen world, and then when bad stuff happens, here's the result. It's called the inability to process pain in a healthy way. The inability to process pain. We... Many times we've lost the ability to process our pain in a healthy way. Back around the World War II era, there was a psychologist, there was a breakthrough psychologist named Viktor Frankl. Anybody heard of him? He was a Holocaust survivor himself. All of his patients were Holocaust survivors. All of his patients were suicidal. And he's known as coming up with something called Logos therapy, which is a breakthrough therapy. And Logos therapy uh, is based on this idea that he felt he knew the solution when people were going through very dark seasons in their life. He said, you know what the solution is? They need to know that they matter. He says people need to know that they matter, that their life matters. So Logos therapy basically kind of leaned into that. I'll tell you the three steps of it, but here's how different that was from the modern thinking. There was another person named Freud. You've probably heard of him. And his thought was the goal of life is pleasure, is that we're here to just get what we can, enjoy, get as much pleasure as we can, and that's the solution, and that's the goal of life. Viktor Frank will come along and says, no, the goal and the solution to life is not pleasure. The goal to fulfillment is purpose. He said, people need to know that they matter, that their life has a purpose. So Logos therapy was basically three things. Number one, find something meaningful to do with your life. Number two, with other people. 
Number three, and find a purpose in your pain. I think about Logos Therapy and I look at our statements of value and pathway on the walls to know God and then find freedom and then to discover your God-given purpose so that you can make a difference. God made you. You matter to him because you're his son and you're his daughter. But he's also made your life to make a difference. Ephesians 2 says that we're handcrafted by God to do good things which God prepared beforehand. We have a dream team here, a few hundred people that serve on the weekends and during the week. They want to do something that makes a difference, so they use what God's put inside of them. They're everywhere today. They're in the nursery. They're on the cameras. They're in the coffee shop. They're in the parking lot. They're on the stage. They're using what God gave them, and they're making a difference. And here's the thing in community, and then find the purpose in your pain. What do I mean by that? Our prison ministry director, Dar Bryant, he's been to prison twice. He lived a really bad life, criminal life, before he came to Christ. One time, and he goes out and he speaks. One time he was speaking at a youth group, and a teenager asked him a question. He said, hey, do you spend a lot of time in regret of the years you lost with your family and the years you lost with your kids? And he thought for a minute, and he said, the Holy Spirit just really put in his heart what to say. And he says, this really is my life. He said, you know, he says, I've chosen to allow God to take my pain and turn it around. And he's given me a purpose. In fact, through all my mess, God's now given me a platform. And I have an opportunity to speak into the lives of people about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that many people don't have the opportunity. I have the ear of people that other people won't even listen to. He says, so I've chosen the path of God has taken all of my mess, all of my pain in the past. He's redeemed it. He's turned around, and he's given me a new purpose. So I glory in what God has done with my life. Amen, somebody? I glory with what God has done in redeeming me. See, some of you today, you're like, Pastor, I feel like man, my life has disqualified me. My divorce has disqualified me. My failures. Hey, listen, I want to tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible says we receive comfort from God and then we comfort others. God can take your pain and turn it into a superpower for him if you'll allow God to work in your life. He'll bring people around you that you can pour into because of what you've gone through. Number five, the fifth way that we get into the cave is isolation and loneliness. Isolation and loneliness. Do you know this? The first problem in the Bible wasn't sin. The first problem in the Bible was solitude. God looks at Adam and he goes, it's not good for man to be alone. And all the ladies said, <laughs> hey, man. I think we can broaden that out. God has created the church, and he uses certain metaphors in the New Testament for the church, but probably one of the greatest metaphors in the Bible is that we are the body of Christ. In other words, God wants us to know, I on purpose put you together with other people because it takes all of us working together, and then we encourage one another. Work, you know, some people say, Pastor, can you be a Christian and love God and not come to church? Well, yeah, you can be a Christian and love God and not come to church, but you can't do most of the things God commands Christians to do, God directs Christians to do, outside of a body of believers. God tells us to pray with one another. He tells us to worship together. He tells us to serve together, right? He tells us to care for one another. And so, in fact, look at this verse, Romans chapter 5, uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 5 says, so in Christ we though we are many, form one body. Somebody say one body. One body, and we are members, and we belong to all the others, all right? Turn to the person next to you right now and say, we belong to each other today, all right? We belong to each other. God's plan is for us to be planted in the house of God. Psalms 91, be planted in his house and you will flourish. Here's the last point today. Most of what we've shared from the life of Elijah, remember Elijah, what did he do? He left his servant, right? He just went into isolation. That wasn't a healthy thing for him. Most of these points that Elijah kind of went on this path to the cave are 
You can probably find them in modern psychology as well. But this last one, I'm going to say this is from the scripture. And this is something I'm passionate about. And it's something that I feel like we need to be aware of. Here's the sixth way we can get into the cave. Spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. You say, Pastor, what does spiritual warfare mean? I know there's warfare going on over there. What do you mean spiritual warfare? Well, Jesus said that there is a thief and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's talking about the devil. He said he's a thief, he's a liar, he's a murderer. Well, I thought the devil wasn't really real. I thought the devil was just in the Sunday school rhyme. Well, you know, thinking that he's not real doesn't change that he is. And if I'm going to have to choose who I believe, I think I'm going to go with Jesus, okay? <laughs> and so if Jesus says he's real, he's real. But he doesn't say that to scare us. He says that to prepare us. He says, I want you to know the enemy is here, and here's what he likes to do. He likes to steal from you. He likes to kill things in your life. He likes to bring destruction. He's not scaring us. He's making us aware because there is such a thing as spiritual attack. In other words, some of those days that you feel like all hell's breaking loose, it's because it is. Let me just give you this example to help you. What if I said, hey, through some modern technology, we've discovered that there is a thief in our area and he now has a key to your house. And we know through intelligence that tonight while you're sleeping, he's going to come into your home and he's going to take everything that's important to you. What would you do? How many would stay awake? How many would not go to sleep? How many would go find your friends, Smith and Wesson, and get them ready, right? You'd call the police, you'd call, you'd like, I don't want to be asleep when the thief comes. And see, the Bible says that sometimes we can be believers and love God, but be spiritually sleeping. We can be in a spiritual state of slumber. We can let the hedge of, of faith and, and, and the power of God in our lives, we can kind of fall. That's why the Bible says, awake, O sleeper, come out of your slumber. In fact, look at this. Probably the best verse for this is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9. 1 Peter says, be alert. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up today, all right? Wake up. You guys are awake. I already know it. Be alert and of sober mind. This is God talking to believers. He's saying, be alert, be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, is prowling around and he's like a roaring lion. He's looking for someone to devour. So just get ready to be devoured. Is that what it says? Nope, what does it say? Resist him. Say it with me, church. Resist him. In other words, God's given us an authority, but we have to use that authority. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. In other words, the devil ain't got anything new. We all go through spiritual warfare. The enemy comes, but what we've got to do is we've got to be alert so that he doesn't come and bring destruction. He doesn't steal from our life. So what do we do? Well, James kind of has the same idea. The book of James chapter four, verse seven says, submit yourself to God, live a surrendered life to God right? Get filled up with all you can of God. He says, then resist the devil. And what does it say? He will flee from you. I wonder if we just got too many Christians that don't resist the devil. They just kind of give in. Listen, when the negativity comes into your mind, when the lies of the devil, well, you might as well just give up. You'll never get past this season of your life. You'll always be in the cave. You'll always be in the darkness. Your marriage will never be uh, what it sh could be. Um, you're always gonna live in regret. When the enemy comes and brings the thoughts and the lies that he brings, we're not supposed to give into that. We're supposed to stand up and we're supposed to say, no, my God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. I I'm a new creation in Christ. God is working all things for my good. God's spirit is with me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He will never let me go. And I mean, earth's gonna be hard. I get that. But you know what? I have courage and I have strength to go through whatever life brings. And I know that I have a final destination that is a party place. It is a resort. And I've got heaven to look forward to. So I'm gonna celebrate a little bit of heaven right now. And I'm gonna resist what the devil tries to bring in my life. Stand up with me today. I'm gonna to pray for you today. Maybe some of you here today and you're going through some difficulties in your life. I'm gonna close with a song. 
because one of the authorities that we have as believers is this, Jesus told his disciples, he said, in my name, you'll win over the devil. And he says, when you pray, I want you to pray in my name. This is a new thing. It had never been done before like that. Jesus said, hey, guys, when you pray, use my name. Go before the Father in my name. You know what he knew? What God was gonna write through Paul in the book of Philippians, a couple chapters before that whole anxiety passage, the scripture says that God has given Jesus the name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and in earth and beneath the earth. Man, that's the angelic powers, that's people, and that's all the demons of hell. At that name, every knee will bow in heaven and earth and beneath the earth and every tongue confess. Hey, there's no power in my name, but there's power in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody, do you believe it today? Come on, his name is above every name. So maybe today, I want you to take the last few minutes as we wrap up this service, and I want you to think, maybe there's an area of your life, maybe you need to speak the name of Jesus over your emotions today. Maybe you need to speak the name of Jesus over your kids today. Maybe you need to speak the name of Jesus and all that that name represents over your life today, over your future today, and begin to thank God and submit yourself to God and push back on the enemy that tries to come against you. Heads bowed and eyes closed today. If you've never made the decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, that's where this all begins. Surrendering our life to Christ. To live a life that's not centered on ourselves, but to live a life that's centered on the person of Jesus Christ. And I'm gonna pray a prayer right where you're standing today. If you've never made that decision, you can pray this prayer and then you can sing this song with a new faith in your heart. If that's you, pray this prayer. Maybe you're gonna rededicate your heart to God today. Say, Jesus, I believe. Just say it right there where you're at, that, that you are the Christ the son of the living God, come into my heart and be the Lord and savior of my life. I give my life to you. I surrender my life to you and I will follow you all the days of my life. Bring the right people around me, Lord, to help me grow in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, can we clap for somebody that might have prayed that prayer? Come on, let's sing about the name of Jesus.
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness, he's over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, whoa. services on your way out. We've got a little book out there called Next, and it's really helpful in taking your next steps in this journey of salvation and having the Lord as your Savior. Amen. Hey, we got prayer partners down here too. Before you leave, if you have a prayer need, come up and have prayer with them. You know, my prayer for you as you leave here today is take the word that you heard, the wonderful word Holy Spirit inspired word from Pastor Mark, this wonderful music. And as you go back out into the world this week in your daily activities, that you apply those things to bring blessing and encouragement to you and to people you're around. Amen. <laughs>